Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey in Your Own Backyard. I am Rob, your host, and today back on the show, Tyler Martin. Tyler, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for letting me come back. Man, thanks for coming back. What do you mean? I'm, I'm enjoying <laughs> this today. You've been making coffees all, all afternoon, so I'm, yeah. the benef- I'm the beneficiary of that. That's been fun. So this episode, people can see by the title, we're going to dive into espresso a little bit. Uh, if people want to go back and look at the episode we did, you and I did, I think it was back in August of last year of 2021. Yep. Uh, we kind of did right. that coffee basics. If you're going to get into coffee, making a great cup at home. And I would say if, if you want to get into coffee, espresso, uh, don't beat me up for that. Espresso is not the place to start. <laughs> um, Probably not. It's uh, it's really jumping off into the deep end. But um, yeah, I would I would definitely say check that first episode out. It, yep. I think kind of lines out if you're wanting to drink better coffee or learn better ways to make coffee, it's... A and, good and primer. That's where I was. And just so you guys know, if you go back and look for that episode, it's episode 58. I think this was going to be like episode 81, but it would be back at episode 58, get into coffee. And I thought you did a great job on that one, really oh, kind of educating on what to expect, grinding. Uh, you know, it's very scientific coffee, espresso, getting into this world. It's kind of geeky, nerdy, and I, I like that. It's not a bad thing. It is. It's um, it's interesting compared to things like, it's more like cooking as opposed to things like wine and whiskey where you open a bottle and enjoy it. You've, you have to execute something and the way that you execute it uh, shows up in the, in the cup. So it's, yeah. it definitely gets a lot more nerdy than, than some other things because there's, you know, minute changes to things can really have a big in, impact. And I would say you can still have really good coffee at home without having to get super nerdy. Oh, completely. Just want to say that you're able to get super nerdy, but you don't have to to really make a good cup of coffee at home. Uh, yeah, it's like anything. You can get, you know, 90 to 95% of, you know, what's optimal out of something and getting that last 5% is you can chase yeah. it for years and spend thousands of dollars and just yeah. trying to get that little bit extra, but you can get to, you know, fantastic espresso and milk drinks at home relatively easily, relatively cheaply. It's still a bit of an investment, but um, you know, I think if you're if it's something you want to get into at just about any budget you can at least get your feet wet with it. Yeah. You know, I think everybody knows or at least associates espresso with Italy. Mm-hmm. And that is where it was born, where yep. it came from. Uh but I will say I thought it was a lot older than what it actually is. Me it's too. not. No. Yeah. No, it's it's kind of a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, essentially we uh, collectively made coffee the same way for hundreds of years and then all of a sudden Somebody in Italy said, well, what if we did this just a whole lot faster? Yeah. And instead of waiting minutes to make a coffee, um, you know, a cafe is trying to pump a bunch of coffee out. If you can make it in 30 seconds instead of three minutes, it's a lot more coffee you can make. So somebody had the brilliant idea. Let's just do the same thing. Just force it with a lot more pressure and see what happens. Yeah, I kind of feel like, uh, and this may, this may be out of line, you tell me, but I kind of feel like espresso Keurig tried to take that for a regular cup of coffee and, and make kind of a similar type of product or process, you know, a quick cup so, of coffee. Yeah, yeah, and Nespresso is kind of the other one that, that yeah. um, even more so on the espresso side, kind of what they specialize in is more espresso type coffee and what yeah. comes out. Um, but yeah, for con- convenience alone, uh, and I, I've got a lot of friends, we actually used to have an espresso machine at home, and, you know, that's... If you think you might want to get into drinking espresso at home and you really don't want to spend a lot of money and it's more about am I going to enjoy drinking this, something like that's not a bad way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing about Nespresso using all their different pods is you're pretty limited on the coffee that you can get and they're all um, very much what I would call European-style coffee, much darker roasted, uh, much heavier coffee, which for some people that's exactly what they want, so that's fine. Okay. Um, but the great thing about having your own espresso machine like you've got here, uh, you, you know, you can have any coffee in the world and, and make it into whatever drink you want. And that's what I think is really eye-opening when you get into coffee and then get into the, you know, the rabbit hole that is espresso because it's, uh, it really opens up all kinds of cool things that you can do. And what I, what I mean by that is, you know, a, a quick example or an analogy might be, you know, getting a burger. You know, sometimes you feel like you want you know, a a bacon on your burger or a certain type of cheese or what you can make it all different kinds of ways. And I think some people think coffee's coffee, you know, yeah. you just, it's, it's black or you put a little cream and sugar in it and that's coffee. And it's really not, I mean, the variations in what you can do 
to what you want to have that particular day is just uh it's, it's awesome and i really it's, enjoy it's that, that and, and a whole lot more yeah um and i think for the people that are thinking they might want to get into espresso just to dispel one thing it is not something you get into because it's a quick easy way to make coffee at home it's a process so it's I the think hardest way to make the coffee. people that i know that enjoy making espresso at home enjoy the process and enjoy actually making it and it's you know drinking it is is half the fun but making it is the other half so no doubt there are people that are more than happy to you know use something like an espresso like a keurig have coffee quickly and there's nothing wrong with that um for me it's kind of the routine especially during you know i got i got into it before work from home but really got down the rabbit hole during the whole work from home thing and that part of the process just kind of became part of the daily routine and something i look forward to doing um, and I acknowledge that might not be for everyone, but the process is really is kind of half the fun. But I, I think for most people, if you're if you're gotten into coffee a little bit, I, I think uh, espresso is probably on your radar. And so that's kind of the point of uh, our episode today is to kind of talk about getting into espresso and, and kind of what that might look like, machines, kind of some basics on what to know, uh, maybe get you ahead of the curve a little bit so that when you, you know, go pull a trigger on something, you've made it with a little bit more information or some of the processes in making a, a good poll. Uh, I'm learning these terms, poll and <laughs> dose and That's right. what it yields and one, one to two and all this kind of stuff. So again, it's a little bit nerdy, but for me, that's a lot of fun, but I do want to just mention for, you know, kind of espresso dummies, all of us that kind of mm-hmm. learned this espresso is a coffee, but espresso isn't a particular bean or anything like that. It, it, espresso is just the, the process method. in which you make the coffee. Yeah, Correct, yep. Now, people will make, and this is where we start getting nerdy, people will make roasts that are blended and designed more for espresso. And without getting too technical, essentially, the darker you roast a coffee bean, the easier it is to extract. So if you use really, really, really light roasted coffee, you're really up against a wall trying to extract it properly and 30 seconds through a machine. Um, and so using darker and darker beans makes it easier. They will also um, rest the beans after they roast them, meaning they'll let them off gas before they package them um, because you actually don't. So the last episode we talked about get fresh coffee, you know, use it within a few days of, of getting it within you know a few weeks. Ultimately um, you can actually have coffee that's too fresh for espresso and it's releasing too much CO2 while you brew. So when you see an espresso roast, typically that means they've rested the beans at the roastery, let some of that CO2 come out before they package it so that when you run it through a machine, you don't have tons of CO2 trying to come out. And so, so people who, who know when you, when you brew coffee, it's just black. Mm-hmm. When you brew an espresso, you're going to get this kind of foam on top, this caramel looking kind of foam. And that's the CO2 that was within the yep. beans that's being released now. That's exactly right. Thing. And it's great. It gives mm-hmm. it some texture and, and, uh, I don't know if it gives it added flavor. Does it give it some e- extra flavor when you get that crema no. on top? No. But just more the texture in the mouthfeel. Yeah. Okay. Really good. It, it's one of those things that it's a it kind of a brilliant piece of marketing from the early days of espresso. Um, it was actually a turnoff originally. People saw it and thought it was some kind of scum. Oh. And uh, the guy we were talking about earlier, Gaggi, who who developed the first, what we know as a modern espresso machine, said no. It, it's, yeah, he said it's the cream of the coffee. So he started calling it the crema and, and it, was a brilliant piece of marketing because now we're all conditioned to think, oh, if there's no creme on it, that's not good coffee. So it's not the case, though. It's not necessarily the case. Okay, it's, you know, you can make fantastic espresso that has very little creme on top. Really, very light roast coffee has less CO two in it, and so especially if it's a lighter roast that's maybe six eight weeks old, still going to taste fine. There's going to be almost no crema. Okay, a very dark roast that you use almost immediately, you may have a huge amount of crema on top. It's not necessarily better or worse, though. Okay, that that makes sense. Um, let, let's jump into if somebody wants to get into espresso. There's two things that they need to have to to make that work. One is an espresso machine, but the more important piece, I think, is a grinder. Uh, if nothing else, it's the piece that's most often overlooked. Okay, um, I mean, I, I think both pieces are are important, but. You can take a, a decent espresso machine and a great grinder, and you're going to make really good coffee. You can take a great espresso machine and a terrible grinder, and it's not going to make good coffee. Right. So it, it kind of becomes the 
the the weakest link in the chain um, and the one that kind of shows, you know, upgrading the grinder kind of makes a bigger difference. So I think you're right. I, I think it's it's overlooked and it's it's maybe even more important than um, – than picking a machine. Yeah, that's kind of what I've figured out and kind of diving down the hole a little bit is that uh, having that really good grinder helps tremendously in what you're going to get out of a, an espresso machine. Yep, yep. So uh, obviously budget matters when people want to get into the espresso. And, and there's, I mean, they make machines from what, from 150 bucks or right around 100 to 150 all the way up to obviously thousands um, budget's going to matter where you dive into this. But I think there's also this saying that, you know, if you really think you're going to like something, buy it once, don't buy it twice. <laughs> yep. You know, so go ahead and in, invest a little bit and get a decent machine that you can kind of grow into. Yep. So I think for the average home user, a machine under a thousand dollars is going to be more than enough. Um, and even down to maybe five or $600 is going to be just fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that being said, I, I, Personally, know people that have twenty plus thousand dollar machines at home, and they are you know they're like having <laughs> these are professional machines. They are professional machines, and they are are works of art, and uh, they are fantastic. But I, I do want to mention the differentiator there that we keep saying machine, mm-hmm. and I think uh, I heard James Hoffman say this: there's a difference between a machine for espresso and an espresso appliance. Mm. And, you know, the, the, quality, the quality of the build, you know, the materials that are used, how much plastic, how much yep. metal, things like that, uh, more kind of gets you into what would be defined as a, an appliance versus a machine. Yeah, I, pretty much the floor for a machine is probably around the three or $400 mark. They make some that are $100, $150. I would absolutely avoid those. Okay. If that's all your budget will allow, I would get a mocha pot and I would get a... French press, you can use that to foam your milk, heat it in the microwave. You can make some good drinks with that. Okay. Some really, really good milk drinks with that. Save up. It's save up and then spend the money on a machine that's actually going to make really good coffee. Everyone that I know that it's gotten a really cheap machine has stopped using it within a few months. and Really? A few months? It. Yes. And okay. just, you know, if if they got more interested in it. There are some people that, that get into it and, you know, ignorance is bliss and they don't really know what they're missing. They're making espresso at home, and they're happy, and it's fine. Yeah. Um, once you kind of realize what else is out there and how good it can be, those are the people that go, all right, this is well, – I need something better. But that's a great point because I think maybe sometimes people go to a cafe and get an espresso or get a milk drink mm-hmm. and go, I want to make this at home, and then just go home and buy a machine like you're describing and can't do it. Right. And figure it can't be done. I can't get the right equipment. You know, the, the cafes have these big, nice machines, and I can't get that, yeah. therefore I can't make this drink. That's not well, true. It's not true, but it's also like going to a, a high-end restaurant and trying a dish that you love and saying, I want to make this at home. We can always make that. Trying to make it in your microwave with no skill. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You're, these are professionals with very, very expensive machines and grinders and years of experience. So you're kind of immediately handicapping yourself by going home and saying, I want to make exactly that. Yeah. It's going to be very difficult to do. So you kind of have to understand that and understand that it's a process that you're going to work towards. And that's where I think people get frustrated and quit is a month in, they go, you know what? My drink doesn't do taste as good as yeah. the one that came from this high-end coffee shop. I, obviously, I just can't do this. The, the learning curve is huge which is, to me, part of the fun. It's not something that you just immediately master. Otherwise, it wouldn't be that interesting. Absolutely. So you just have to, you know, just kind of stick with it and understand that, you know, when I, when I first got a uh, espresso machine and started making drinks, it probably took a solid month before I made something that I was like, okay, this is drinkable. Oh, really? Not even that was like cafe quality. That was just, uh, okay, I enjoy drinking yeah. this. It's, it's a big learning curve. Now, I probably, knowing what I know now, um, there were just a lot of things that I was not doing right and was ignorant and didn't know where to go to, to get information. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's just part of the learning process. I, I think, uh, and the reason I was saying that was, yeah, absolutely that you, you can get to that point. And I think part of the process is having the right equipment. So if you're going to get into that yep. world, um, understand the investment that it's going to take to, to make sure that you kind of achieve that quicker. Yep. Um, and if you can't do it right when you're ready to get into that world, you know, just take your time and, and, uh, and save up, but, but definitely, you know, invest in some pieces of equipment, a grinder and a machine 
that are, one, going to get you to where you want to go, and two, when you buy a machine, tell me if I'm wrong, this is going to, what I purchased is going to last me 10, 12, 15 years easy. Oh, at least. Yeah. Yeah, if it's so, properly cared for, it'll, it'll last a long, long time. When you're thinking about an investment into a product like that, it, it's worth the investment is my point. So, it is. Absolutely, it yeah. is. Well, and to that point, they do last a long time, and there are a lot of people that buy machines that, that get burned out or realize it's not for them. So I encourage people to look for used stuff. The grinder oh, that I used was point. used. Um, it was six seven hundred dollars new. I got it for one hundred fifty dollars on Craigslist because the guy just say that again. How much new? Six seven hundred dollars. And you bought it for one hundred fifty. That's a yeah, and it's it's a great grinder. I absolutely love it. Um, it's called a Maycap M four. Um, it's a flat burr grinder, which we can get into the different types of burrs later. But um, yeah, there's there's nothing wrong, especially if you're just thinking you want to get into something. At looking on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, wherever, because there's all the time machines out there yeah. um, that people just either they've upgraded and they just want to free up counter space or they've just decided it's not for them. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great point. I hadn't even thought about that, yep. but definitely take advantage of that yep. that world out there. I'm sure to your point, there's a lot of those out there. Um, I, I think talking about now, once you have that, well, let's talk about machines specifically. We, sure. we talked about kind of entry level. Let's talk about, let's give three or four that we might recommend. I'd say more you would recommend. I did a little research before I pulled the trigger on what I bought and what I saw out there. But uh, what we might recommend as a good entry point for something that's going to last you for a while. Yep. So you mentioned, um, you know, machines being Italian. And you'll find that most good espresso machines are Italian made the one exception to that is Breville, and they've got a, a very good foothold in the marketplace. Um, that the machine I have is a Breville, and it's the one that I recommend to a lot of people, especially if they're not a hundred percent sure that they want to, you know, jump into the deep end. Um, it's called the Barista Express. Uh, now I think they run in the six to seven hundred dollar range, so they're by no means cheap, but they have an integrated grinder, so they're very convenient. It's not the best grinder. That's why I got a replacement. Sure. Um, it's not the best grinder, but it gets you into it and learning, and then you can decide, you know, is this something I want to stick with? Then you can upgrade the grinder. You can still use the machine without the, the integrated grinder. You don't have to use that. Um, I certainly don't. But then that way you can kind of start bolting on. And then in a few years, I'll probably upgrade to a better machine, keep the grinder that I have. But I think the Breville is a good starting point. I think you can get them used probably for four to five hundred dollars, and I think that's a good way to go. Now, if you are a little bit more sure that this is something that you're going to to stick with, or you've just got the budget for it, I think going the way that you did with the Ranchilio Silva is a fantastic machine. We've been playing with it for a little bit before the show, and it's a really really fun machine to use. Works great. So that's one that I would definitely recommend. Another one is called the Gaggia Classic. Um, they're a little bit less expensive than the Silva, but not much. They're, um, kind of in that same, call it like a prosumer class. In I'm glad you said that. Six, because seven, eight hundred dollars range, something like that. Yeah. I think that's a, a great adjective to use for the machines that we're talking about. That that's something that's common in the yep. espresso world for home espresso machines is a prosumer. Yeah, it, these are the very bottom end of prosumer. Normally prosumer, people are thinking of things like the Rocket Apartamento that's about $1,300. You're getting it like the Protex, things like that, that are more in the twelve to $1,500 range um, that are a little bit heavier built. Um, they'll usually have more like stainless steel and chrome on them. They just have a certain look. If you see one, you yeah. just get let, that's a prosumer machine. But I would I would still put these in that same class because it's a... Um, cafe quality machine, just in a smaller version. And you were telling a story before we got on the air. That's how the Ranchilio came to the U.S. Is yeah, some folks here in the U.S. saw a lot it. Of love. Yeah, saw it on a counter in in Italy and said, you know, that actually would fit in an apartment. We should bring that back to the states and sell it, even yeah. though they were using it as a commercial machine. So, yeah. um, I would put that in the same class. There's a company called Lilit, L E L I T. Uh, they make some really good machines in that same class. They have one called the Anna that I think is about six, seven hundred dollars, something like that. Um, uh, now, the three that I just mentioned, the Ranchilio, the Gaggia, and the Lilit, those are all just espresso machines. They don't have a grinder. So when I'm talking about prices, you may think, well, that's the same price as the Breville, but it doesn't have a grinder. You need to spend another three, four hundred dollars on that too. So yeah. um when I'm talking to people and they're they're interested in getting to into espresso, if, if you want to build a legit setup, 
I think in a minimum you're looking at about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. Before you know, cups and add-ons and things like that. But just for a machine and grinder, be prepared to buy new somewhere a thousand twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, and I I think the uh, the Gaggia is a is a great uh, option. I, I've never seen one or used one, but just the reviews and everything mm-hmm. that I saw on this one uh, for that person because the entry point there is about four hundred fifty bucks for that machine. So if you have a thousand dollar budget, you can still build buy a really nice. Uh, yep. And, and the internal parts, the boiler and everything on the Gaja is supposed to be really, really good. Where you save that money is more on the, you know, aesthetically there's some it's more not plastic the and machine. yeah, there, there's some it's not. yeah, it's the quality of the the outside of it. It's not as good as yeah. what the actual insides are. Yeah, and the other cool thing about Gaja is I would kind of liken it to it's like the Jeep of espresso machines. The the community that's out there, the modifications people do, the availability of parts, um, it's. There's so many things you can do to them. They're easy to work on. So I think they're great from that standpoint, especially if you want to buy one used and it needs a couple of things fixed or replaced. Very easy to do. Easy to find the parts. Easy to find people that know, can kind of walk you through how to do it. So I think that's one reason they're so popular. That's a great point just on the two machines that we're specifically talking, well, not specifically, but bringing up that we like. They're in Chilio Silva and the guys yet. There are, you know, Facebook groups and forums out there that, I mean, they, they pimp these things out. Mm-hmm. I mean, so as far as having resources to help you uh, continue to kind of modify that machine to get it to do more things that you might want, that option is there. So yes. uh, yep. you can do those things. You don't necessarily have to go buy a brand new machine. Correct. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I, I don't like as much about the Breville is they are not a machine that you take the back off of and start working on. Uh, yeah. They're just not made for that. They, they're, they're almost overly complicated for the, for the way that they're built, um, as opposed to like the Gadget. It's a very simple machine the way that it's built. So it's, it's it easy seems to like troubleshoot, easy to work on. The Breville, not so much. That seems to be the approach on the Italian machines. And we yes. you mentioned they're all Italian. The other one that I saw that had good reviews that looked pretty good was the Quick Mills. I'm not familiar with that one. I've heard the name, but I've, I've never seen one. Uh, I, I looked at and considered the Quick Mills Pippa. But everywhere I went, it was out of stock, really? so I didn't end up. And the reason I considered that one uh, versus the the Ranchilio Silva was it had the uh, the gauge for the pressure. Ah, uh, okay. Which I kind of found interesting, just kind of watching some videos. But we can get into that in a little bit. But that was the thing that kind of made me consider that one. Yeah, yeah, and that's a that's an interesting one. Um, some people like to have the pressure gauge. I don't. To me, I don't know how important it is. Um, at least it doesn't tell me much. Now, some machines you can actually go in and, and adjust the pressure that's coming through the group head. Yeah. Um, the one that I have, I, I don't believe you can do that. I'm not sure if you can do that on Silva. You might be able to. But, again, it's just one of the many tweaks that you can make on a machine to get just that little bit more out of the coffee. Yeah. You know, you, there's all the different variables that go into it. Um, you can just about change you know, the temperature of the water, the pressure that it's going through, the size of the grind, all those things. You can make little tweaks here and there, and that's that's kind of part of the fun. I'm going to ask you a question. Now, we've mentioned the Breville as mm-hmm. a good quality kind of entry point, if that's the budget with the grinder and everything. When, when people, if they say that's kind of the route I'm going to go start exploring and look at, they're going to go to stores like Bed Bath & Beyond and other places that are going to have that brand, but next to it, they're going to have another brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly. DeLonghi. DeLonghi. Yeah, it, they make good machines. Okay. Um, Just wanted to give a... I don't have a ton of experience with them. Okay. I've, I've only used a couple of different ones a couple of times. From what I can gather, it feels like at every price point, there's a better machine. I think their machine that's very similar to the Barista Express, they're a similar price. I think the Barista Express is a better machine. They're higher-end machines that are competing with things like the Ranchilio. I think it blows them away. Yeah. So... I, they're not bad machines by any means. I just think at each price point, there's probably something better. And and I'm going to agree with you 100. percent And the reason I have that opinion is I'm watching, you know, what what is now my encyclopedia of information called YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, every every channel that I've watched that uh, wanted to compare an entry level machine to a Ranchilio or something like that, it was always the Breville Barista. I've mm-hmm. never seen. And I'm sure they're out there. I just haven't ran across it. It's not enough that I've noticed one with the DeLonghi yet. Yep. So I'm, I'm just making the assumption that P- 
people's opinion is that's a pretty good machine, the Breville. It is. Um, there's certainly limitations. I think it's it's not anywhere near in the class of the Ranchilio, just in overall construction, you know, the way that it's used, um, the flexibility, things you can do with it. But it's a great machine to learn with. And I'll be honest, if I started with a more complicated machine, I don't know that I necessarily would have stuck with it. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that this machine is good with is it's it's almost like a training wheels espresso machine. And that kind of seems to be Breville's approach is to kind of give yes. you more bells and whistles and functionality to make it kind of easier mm-hmm. for you. May not have that quality build, but yeah. I think there's still products that are going to last a while. But from that standpoint, if you don't have a lot of experience in coffee and you're starting to get into that and you want to jump to espresso pretty quick, I think the Breville's a, a great option for that. The ease of use and... Um, for lack of a better term, idiot proofing that they put into the machines. They're probably the best at doing that. For example, the new version of this machine under the steam wand is a little um, temperature pad. And you just set the the pitcher on that. And when it gets to the right temperature, it cuts the steam wand off. Ah. Because that's one hard thing. We were talking about this before the show, learning the temperature to get milk to. Well, they just take that variable out for you. Yeah. Some people would love that. I don't think that I would because I want to, I want to learn and, do it correctly. Yeah. Um, so if I started doing that in the first few times, was using that feature and feeling the side of the picture, I would learn, all right, that's the temperature. And then I would probably stop using it. But I'm sure a lot of people love that. So it's a lot of things like that that they do with, with the integrated grinder. That's all about just convenience, ease of use. So they're trying to make a machine that takes as much of the headache out of it as possible, which I, I, I enjoy that. Um and I think that's one of the reasons why I recommend it to a lot of people. If they're wanting to get into it, get started without spending a ton of money and they don't know anything about espresso like I didn't know anything when I got into it, it just it, it makes it a lot easier to get started, I think. Absolutely. Uh, and for me, it just uh, having access to you and people like Jordan, <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps that curve. So I kind of said I'm going to go – you know, a little bit more just to kind of, because you guys can help me out a little bit. Well, so. as a way of background, if, if uh, folks haven't listened to the first episode, uh, I am not involved in coffee professionally anyway. I've never have been. I am just a guy that decided to make better coffee at home. So I am kind of along the journey as well, just yeah. learning and, and trying to figure stuff out. So I don't know how qualified I am to be here to talk about it, but well, you... uh, at least I can speak from the experience of knowing nothing to where I am now and the and kind you, of the, the journey. So people understand when you dive into something, you, you dive in pretty deep. So you're not just looking for a little information. You're looking for as much as you can get. Um, so when you when you come after a period of time and, and have done the the work, we, we get the benefit uh, of having that. So. I'm just regurgitating YouTube, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, James Hoffman. <laughs> a lot of it. Matt Perger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think that's actually a good point to bring up. If anybody is is getting into espresso or any kind of coffee, YouTube is a fantastic resource. And there's a couple of guys that Rob just mentioned, uh, a guy named James Hoffman, uh, British guy, uh, former World Barista Champion, um, is a co-owner of a, a coffee roaster in London. His videos, first of all, they're incredibly well thought out, well put together, um, but just the uh, the production value is very – they're just fun to watch, but uh, knows a ton about coffee, and well, just watching through his channel, you learn so much. Matt Perger is another one that you mentioned. He's an Australian guy. Um, he is extremely nerdy about things in a, in a really great way and does a really good job of explaining the science behind – how and why things work the way that they do in coffee. So those are two really good ones for anybody interested getting into coffee. Check those two channels out. Well, and, and what I mentioned to you, and I haven't watched a lot of Matt's channel yet. I've kind of been wa- binge watched uh, James Hoffman. But what I mentioned to you is he does a really good job of dummying it down. And you made the comment that he does that without making you, you know, belittling you, making you feel yep. like you're dumb for not knowing. Yeah. Uh, which I really appreciate because he really makes it, uh, he, he he delivers the message in a way where you feel like, okay, I can do that, you know, and you really feel you can yep. come away from watching his shows feeling a little more confident about what you learned and that you can apply that and what you're trying to do with your coffee. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So um, let's get ready to take a break because I'd, I'd like another coffee while as we're <laughs> talking. We're, we're, we're drinking a little bit. But before we take that break, I wanted to mention that, you know, let's get into just real quick 
the types of coffees that you make with an espresso machine. Um, so, so we black kinda, coffee and then milk coffees. Oh, I got you. Okay, just just um, kind of outlining because I think when people go, gotcha. they go, you make an espresso or you make a cappuccino and a, and a latte. I think yep. those in Amer- in America, I'm speaking for kind of the communities we are in. Those are what people think of espresso, yep. latte, maybe cappuccino. Those are certainly the three most common. Yeah. Um, kind of along the same lines as the espresso would be the americano, which is just espresso with some hot water in it. Yep. Um, which essentially was was designed to mimic filter coffee. Um, when Americans would go on vacation in Italy and wanted more American style coffee, they would just add some hot water to it to make it a longer drink, and they just called that americano. Here's what I didn't know with an americano. I thought, well, and I, I, I'm sure cafes do it both ways, but what I've come to understand is that if you're going to do it the proper way in serving this to a customer, you serve the shot of espresso, and then you give a little pitcher of hot water so they can add it to the to where they want. I thought it was just going to be, if you have this much espresso, you're going to put this much milliliters of hot water, and then you get served the cup of yep. Americano. Uh, come to find out that's not the case. You should be able to dilute it to the level you want. I think that's that would be preferred. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of places that do it both ways. But, yeah, yeah I, I don't drink Americano. I either do just black filter yeah. coffee or I do espresso or a milk drink. Uh, but if I was going to order an Americano, that's the way I would want it served. Yeah. That way I can so add whatever I want. We have a single espresso. We have a double. Mm-hmm. We have the Americano. And then you have a, a Lungo. Am, am I saying that yep. right? And then kind of filter coffee, which really isn't made yep. by an espresso machine. But that's kind of the black coffee yep. that you can get. And a Lungo is basically the same amount of coffee, actual dry coffee used as pulling just a double shot. You just run more water through it. So it becomes kind of like Americano. It's a little bit more diluted. Okay. But instead of adding hot water, you just run more water through the through the coffee. Okay. And we'll get into, you know, under extraction and over extraction as we get another cup here in a second. But milk coffees, mm-hmm. macchiato, mm-hmm. and then you got the cortado. One of my favorites. Flat white. And those are three right away that I think people might have heard of the macchiato, but I don't think... I hadn't heard of a, a cortado, and I didn't hear a lot about flat whites. But then you have the cappuccino and the cafe latte. Yep, yeah, those are the main ones, um, and there's a few others. But macchiato is a very um, misunderstood one, and mo- mostly because a lot of the coffee shops you go to in America, you order a macchiato. First of all, half the time it's iced. I don't know why, <laughs> um, but otherwise, it usually has flavorings in it, and it's a lot more just like a flavored latte. There's a lot of milk in it. A real macchiato is just a shot of espresso with a spoonful of foam on top. Okay. That's it. Um, they're really great, but it's basically just a shot of espresso, a little bit of foam on top. Macchiato is Italian for marked, so you mark the coffee with a little bit of milk. That's all it is. Okay. S- stepping up from there by volume of milk would be the cortado. It's just ev- even parts, equal parts of espresso and milk, steamed milk, not foamed. Uh, and then flat white would be the next one. That's probably my personal favorite. Um, it's usually somewhere around four to five parts milk to one part coffee, somewhere in there. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, and then it's other kind of hallmark is that it has very, very fine bubbles and they call it micro foam. So if it's made correctly, the top is almost shiny. You don't see big bubbles like you do on others. So it's got a very silky texture. It's a little bit lighter in body. One of my absolute favorites Next up would be a latte. Um, a latte and a cappuccino have the same amount of milk in them. Generally speaking, the cappuccino just has foam on top. Uh, about half of the milk that goes into a cappuccino is in the form of foam. So uh, typically, a, a well-made cappuccino will actually just be white on top. It'll just be a dome of foam on the top. Um, and that's kind of, that's where the name came from. Um, For the cap, the white yeah. cap. Yeah, okay. it was... Um, whoever came up with it, it remi- reminded them of the capuchin monks that yeah. shaved the tops, tops of their heads. Um, and so uh, everybody loves latte art, right? Yeah. Cappuccino kind of rules that out just by its nature. You're not going to have latte art in the cappuccino. Um, another one is a mocha, which there's not a whole lot of standardization about the way that's made. But essentially, it's just a latte or cappuccino made with chocolate. Oh, really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... I've not done that or heard of that or seen that made yet. So I'm going to be interested to see 
what that process is. How does the chocolate, we can talk about this when we come back. So just shave a little bit of, uh, especially if you like dark chocolate, shave right. some in the bottom of your cup, make espresso on top of it that'll melt it, and then pour milk That's on it. top of it, and dust some cocoa powder on top. Okay. Fantastic. That, that sounds like a tasty after-dinner drink. It's really good. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a break. Let's make a uh, couple of new drinks and come back and, and kind of get a little bit nerdy. Let's do it. Okay. Let everybody know what uh, what we're drinking now. Tyler. Oh, we made little Cortados. Uh, little, you say we. A little uh, afternoon pick-me-up, as if we Hi. haven't had enough coffee yet. Yeah, but. Tyler made these. But we both did the right thing today. We knew we were going to record this afternoon, so no coffee in the morning like we typically do. We waited till. uh I got my caffeine intake this afternoon. Yeah. It might yeah. be a long night, but that's all right. So let, let's start getting, I guess we can call it nerdy, s- geeky, scientific, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's jump into, we talked about machines and we talked about grinders and kind of have, we really didn't talk about grinders. Let's, let's talk about those real quick okay? Uh, before we dive into the kind of nerdy part of this. Uh, because I think people need to understand what are some good entry-level grinders. You know, we talked about the machines. What are some grinders that you would recommend uh, Let's talk about the one I bought. I bought this before I had an espresso machine, but it would work. I think it's working really good. Okay. Yeah. And this is the uh, this is from Breville. It's a Breville uh, Smart, Smart Pro. Grinder Pro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think it, it's worked. This first time I've used one. I think it works really good. And, and the nice thing about it, um, you can really quickly go between filter coffee, espresso. And that's one of the challenges with especially lower priced grinders is they may do fine for pour overs and things like that, but they can't get fine enough and consistent enough to do espresso. So there are some grinders, even in the two to three hundred dollar range, that are just are not made for um, for making espresso. So that's the first thing to look at. Find some reviews and find out is this something that actually can get fine enough? Uh, even if they the manufacturer will say you can make espresso with it, there are some that just they won't get fine enough. Yeah, and we're making coffee today at a setting that could go finer. We're at uh, four and out it, of... And we can go down to a, a one. What is, what is, is it four to 10 or four to... I mean, one to 10, one to 20? Oh, no, no. This goes one to 60. 60? So, yeah. I mean, you're on the very, very fine end, but there is room to go finer. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, to me, my point there would be, you know, we're still getting good coffee and we haven't, you know... People might think if it's not a good grinder, you, you're down to the lowest setting and you're still not getting right. fine enough for you. This one we're showing yep. gets fine enough, and we had room to go finer yep. if we felt we needed to. A, a good example of that is I think on the last show I even recommended, or one of the ones I'm, a grinder I mentioned was called the Baratza Encore. It's a, a great machine. but Not, it just, as, not as expensive as this. No, I think they're like $150, yeah. something like that, but they won't go fine enough for espresso. Oh, they don't? No, they, they really won't. Okay. They say that they will, but I've known people that have tried to use them for espresso, and they're just they're just not made for that. They're, I they're know great Wade for what has they that, are. That, yeah, yeah, they're great for for filter coffee. I think okay. for the money, it's probably one of the best things out there. They're just not really designed for espresso, and that's fine. Um, so, so, so that might be a point, you know, to the last show. If you're going to go get a grinder, even if you're not sure you'll ever get into espresso, you may spend an extra thirty, fifty bucks to get one that would go that way. Just in case you ever get the bug. Completely agreed. Yeah. Okay. The consistency of a grinder matters a lot more in espresso than it does in filter coffee. So you're better off getting something that you know can do espresso because the margin for error is a lot bigger on the filter coffee side, if that makes sense. Okay. Like you want a grinder that will actually do espresso. Even if it may not be the best thing for filter coffee, it's going to be fine. If you know what I'm saying. Um for example, the grinder that I have is not made to do filter coffee. It's a flat burr grinder, which we can talk about what that means. Yeah, we'll get into that. It is specifically made to make espresso. I have made filter coffee with it. It does a great job. It's just a little cumbersome. It's just it's not really made for that, but it'll do it. But I got it because that's my espresso grinder. I use a different grinder for pour overs and stuff like that. Okay. For no other reason than that's just a pain in the butt to to change the grind setting. It's a worm gear, so Turning it from the, the espresso setting to the pour over setting takes about two minutes of turning a little knob and it's just yeah, annoying. It's manual. It's very, very manual. So yeah. in the low end, and I was just looking uh, at some prices on my phone so I don't tell people the wrong thing, kind of one of the, the grinders that's really well liked and, and recommended a lot is called the Baratza Seti 270. Uh, they're about 400 bucks. That's a really, really good grinder. Um, I think that and the, the Breville. Um, 
Smart Grinder Pro, those are probably two of the better value grinders that you can get out there. Um, so here's a question you make me think of when you say the uh, the one you just mentioned for 400. Mm-hmm. I know that when you jump from that, you're you're probably thinking niche niche. Yep. And the difference in cost that's typically five hundred, or is it more than that? If you can find them, they're about six oh, seven hundred dollars. Okay. I don't know um, why I was thinking five. They're they're just really hard to find. They're in oh, such are they high really? demand. Yes. Okay. Um, and to to put it into perspective, how good that grinder is, James Hoffman, who we've talked about ad nauseum today, that's the grinder he uses a lot on his channel. It's a six hundred dollar grinder. This is somebody that. He also did a, a video um, reviewing grinders and had one on there that was like three thousand dollars. Yeah, but he's still using the niche a lot of the time. Um, there's a few things to consider with it. It is a conical burr grinder, if that matters to you. For most people, it won't. Um, you know, there there's two different camps: the flat burrs, the conical burrs. People will say one's better than the other. Well, there is there are no absolutes. They're so now we're going to get into the nerdy part of that because now people are going, well, what the sure. hell is the difference? So just imagine a, a, a conical burr grinder is exactly what it sounds. It's two cones that nest on top of each other, and when you feed beans in, they just grind through and fall out the bottom. Um, they're, these are some kind of generalities. They're usually not quite as precise as flat burrs and not quite as consistent. That being said, really good conical burr grinders will outperform lower end flat burr grinders. So there's no absolutes. Um, flat burr is what you'll see most often in a coffee shop. They're a little slower, but they, it's two discs that sit on top of two burrs that sit on top of each other, like two flat plates. And it uses centrifugal force to force the coffee out. Okay. Sides. Um, they generally, again, speaking are a little bit more consistent. They'll make less, um, it's called fines, and it's kind of the powder that comes out of the, the grinder that'll choke an espresso machine because that will uh, just immediately gum up. Okay. Um, so you'll generally have less than that, and that's where getting a better grinder really will help. If you, a cheaper grinder is going to make more fines, it's going to be harder to work with. It's going to be less consistent. You're kind of just setting yourself up for failure using a grinder that's not made for espresso or that just doesn't do a good job. Am I, am I fair in saying that flat burrs are aren't as common as conical burrs? Uh, in the price range that most people would be getting right. into grinders, yes. Yeah. High-end things. I haven't looked this up. I would venture to say the low-end price for a flat burr grinder is probably in the six $700 range okay. or more. Yeah. Um, but there are some great ones if you do want to invest in one. The one that I mentioned is called the Makeup M4. That's what I've got. Um, it, it is basically... Not a knockoff, but a um, a reproduction of a grinder uh, called the Mazer Mini. That's a channel we were watching on on YouTube earlier. That the kid out here in Katie that was making oh, yeah. coffee that was a, a Mazer Mini. Oh, okay. really, really good grinder. Um, and it's kind of the um, it's kind of in the same class as the Ranchilio Silva in being not an entry level machine, not super super high end. But just really, really good machine. Okay, that's what the the Mazer Mini is. Okay, great flat burr grinder, six, seven, eight hundred dollars. I don't know what they run now. They may be more than that now. Uh, so in the world of grinders, certainly not on the low end, but there's some that are three plus thousand dollars that are, and that's way overkill. Flat burr. That's a flat burr grinder. Flat burr. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um. So the the niche that we were talking about, it is a conical burr grinder. Uh, what it's kind of known for and where they made a splash, it's called the Niche Zero because it's designed for zero retention, meaning you put 20 grams of coffee in, 20 will come out. Which is um, impressive. And people have done tests on this to within tenths of a gram, it it will almost have zero retention, which is, is a very attractive thing because you can control exactly what goes through it. Uh, it's strictly a single-dose grinder, meaning every time you use it, you have to open the top, pour the beans, the measured beans in, and that's what will come out, as opposed to one that has a hopper like both of ours have where you can put a whole bag in there and just turn it on for a set period But you of time. don't like using a hopper. I is don't it, use the hopper, no. Is it because you think the beans get too much air in there? And, and Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to, to well, that point. I may point, go a week without making espresso. Uh, a lot of times okay. during the week I'm not making. Uh, so a, you're not using that grinder for anything else, where I'm using mine for other I just stuff. switch yes. it and make my pour yep. over. Okay. But I may only make, I generally am only making espressos on the weekend. Uh, so I'm, I'll go a week without making it, and I would just 
rather the beans not. Be but if I'm using hopper. it every day, making the hopper is not a bad thing. No, it seals no, no, no. You'll enough go through, that it's okay. Yeah, you'll go through okay. a bag fast enough, and it seals well enough. That's not a problem. Okay, I just wanted to make sure if you had an opinion of no. don't use the hopper no. for whatever reason. No, that's fine. It seals it. Okay. Uh, well, now we've talked about the uh, the two main pieces of equipment: uh, the the grinder and the machine, the espresso machine. Let's start getting into because people are going to go. Okay, get these things home. How easy is it to actually make a drink? And uh, we talked a little bit earlier. There's still some work. There's still some calculation. There's still a process here to make sure you get something that you're going to enjoy. That's right. Yeah. So the process is of of doing that is called dialing in the machine, and this is really what you're dialing in is the machine for a specific bean, um, and that's why what I recommend is. When you're getting your machine set up, find a bean that you like and just stick with that for a while. Espresso doesn't really lend itself for bouncing back and forth between eight different coffees because each one may have a slightly different setting. And people are hearing you say a bean. They're going, it's a coffee bean. Coffee beans, kind of touch on that real quick. I know we did in the last episode, but just talk. They're different. Light roast, medium roast, light medium, dark roast, where it comes from, single origin, washed, not washed, all that kind of stuff. That's right. Even down to the altitude where it's grown. The higher it's grown, the more dense it is, uh, which means it's going to behave differently when you grind it and brew it. So, and that is way over my head. All that I know is that every bean acts differently. If you want to get really nerdy, it'll your machine, your grinder, the same beans will act differently day to day based on temperature, humidity, all oh, that, that makes stuff. Makes sense. Now you're getting down to very, very small margins of error there. It's way beyond the scope of, of what I'm doing. Um, but there are people that will dial in their grinder and their machine every day. Really? Based on the temperature, the humidity, everything. The first shot they make, they will almost always pour out because they're dialing it to a specific thing. That's quite a palette somebody it has is. to be able to pick up those it nuances. We, like we mentioned before, it's that extra 5% that you're trying to yeah. get. Now, that first shot's probably 95% great, but... Well, I because hope I they get want to. to point. They'll yeah. dial in just a little bit more. So, so, so your point in talking about bean is when you buy a bean, uh, and you dial it in for that specific bean, and that's where if I use the hopper, and I know what I need to grind yep. to and get to, and, and whatever the grams, the dose, um, stick with that for a yep. while, and then you know you're going to get a consistent pull every time. Yep. So, um, just to kind of break it down a little bit. Um, what we're kind of talking about, we're talking about dose and yield and all that stuff. That's called a recipe. And so the general framework, and I'll call it that because it's always going to be tweaked a little bit, is roughly you want twice the amount of coffee in milliliters as dry coffee in grams. So, for example, if you start with 15, you more or less want to have about 30 milliliters of coffee at the end. Um at least, maybe more like 35, something like that. So that's your brew recipe. Uh, and then the other variable is the amount of time that it takes for that amount of water to pass through that amount of coffee. And that's kind of the measuring stick that people use. If you're trying to use 30 grams in to 32 out, it's somewhere around 28 to 30 seconds. And so when you're dialing in a grinder and you know, that if I pull a shot and it's 30 seconds, I should be in the ballpark. Now I can taste it and say, is it a little bit sour? Maybe I need to go a little bit finer. Is it a little bit bitter? I Maybe I need to go a little bit coarser, whatever it might be. Um, and um, tasting is what really tells you what direction you need to go. Um, because generally, there's some general thoughts here that, you're going to get a certain profile for under extraction. Yes. And then a certain profile, a taste for over extraction. Yes. So if you know those two, mm -hmm. you can kind of go, yeah. okay, I went too much here. I went too little yeah. here. And it'll be obvious sometimes if you put 15 in, get 30 out in 12 seconds, you don't need to taste that. It's going to be awful. Yeah. Don't even bother. But once you get into that kind of accepted 26 to 34 second range, then you can start tweaking it to say, okay, if it's over extracted, meaning you've pulled too much out of the coffee, it's going to taste bitter. Um, it's just, it, the, that's the biggest note is just bitter. It'll maybe taste a little bit too roasty, a little harsh. Um, that's when you know you've over extracted it, which generally means that your grind is too coarse because the water was able to pass through too quickly and pull too much out. So you want to go the other direction, go a little bit finer. Um, the opposite of that is if you're under extracted, it's going to taste sour, hollow, um, and a little bit um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I guess just acidic and sour. That's really yeah. the, the main hallmark. And so once you start tasting it, that's when you can kind of dial it finer or coarser because what you're doing when you're, you're changing the grind setting between fine and coarse, you're not changing the amount of coffee, the amount of water. You're changing the time. Yeah. You're using the grind setting to change the time that it takes to pass through. Because uh, essentially what you're creating is a, a sieve or a screen for water to pass through. And the harder it is to pass through, the longer it takes. Well, right. and tell me if, if we're visualizing this. So when you think about an espresso machine, um, and I've come to learn some of the terms for the equipment we use, the portafilter mm-hmm. is what you see where there's a basket that goes in, and the grind, the grounded, the ground coffee that you get is what goes into that. Right. And the you don't just put it into that and then attach it to the espresso machine and make coffee. There's a there's still a process that you need to go through to make sure that you have that coffee in the right state so that it, it, it gives you the expression that you're looking for. And I'll let you talk more about that because you want it to have, I'll, I'll say, a seal around it. You want it to have chunks taken out, you know, yep. and people are going to hear all this and go, shit, that's a lot to make a cup of coffee. It's really not that much. And to me, I, I kind of like that process of doing all of those things and trying to make a, a great cup of coffee. But it's not just putting the grounds in and then attaching it to the machine and then, you know, hitting the button and you get right. coffee. There's still a process once you get the grounds that you have to kind of, um, you know, do some things to those grounds to make them right ready to, to be brewed. Yeah, so espresso, generally speaking, is using about nine bars of pressure. So nine times our normal atmosphere. It's a lot of pressure. And so water wants to find the path of least resistance. So if you don't prepare the, the puck or the bed of coffee well, it's going to find a channel to go through, and that's what it's called, channeling. It's going to go through there, which means it's not extracting a whole lot because it's, it's, it's not using all the coffee. It's not using all the coffee. It's just going through one specific spot. It's running way too fast. Um, and so that's why pre- preparing the, the puck is is so important. So um, I'm glad you said that puck is what ends up mm-hmm. once the carter, the, the coffee's been that's right. wet. Yep. Or what, then the pressure. Like a little yeah. puck of coffee. That's right. You know what it reminds me of? A little Reese's peanut butter yeah, cup. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. 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 So just, you know, for anybody listening that is completely new to espresso and doesn't really know how it works, you're basically just taking the beans, grinding them into the basket that you mentioned. You're um, using a tamper to level it off and and push it down, which takes a lot of the air out, makes it harder for the water to get through because the the grains of coffee can get closer together. You're plugging that into what's called the group head, uh, and that's where there's a shower screen where the water comes in. Uh, and what it'll do, the machine will fill that void with water and then using water pressure, just force it through the coffee in about 30 seconds, like we said. Um, and so that's why getting it prepared is is so important because you're talking about a lot of pressure in a very small area. Yeah, and the, and the goal is that amount of coffee that you put in that basket, all of that co- should contribute to the flavor that you're getting out. If, if you don't do that right, to your point earlier, if you get a channel off to the side or something – that's where the water is going to go, and you're missing extracting the flavor from the amount of coffee that you put in. The whole point is the coffee that goes in that basket should all contribute to what comes out in the glass. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's start talking about um, when we talk about equipment that we need to use, tampers and things like that, when we level coffee, that that's very important because to the point we made earlier – if, if your coffee's dense on one side of the basket versus the other, it still plays a role. And I mean, so it's just a whole kind of list of things that you have to do very well and precise to make sure. And I hear you and Jordan always talking about, uh, not always, but you've mentioned, uh, you know, getting that perfect pole. And you guys still say, you know, I get really good poles, but I don't know that I've had the perfect pole yet because it's such a precise kind of thing that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, there are people that are way bigger in espresso than we are and have been doing it way longer and are a lot better that still will say they haven't had that that one unicorn yeah. shot. And, you know, everybody's looking for that, you know, everything just aligns perfectly. And I think that's part of what makes it fun is that you can always do it better. Yeah. Right? Um, there's always something to learn and tinker and play with. Um, but... To your point, yes. I mean, preparing the coffee, getting it leveled off, getting it tamped consistently, 
I think that's the biggest thing I've mentioned multiple times. Espresso is all about consistency. The consistency of the grind size, the consistency of how the coffee is laid in the basket, the consistency from one shot to the other of how you're tamping it. Um, that's probably the most challenging thing is just getting to where you can kind of repeat the same thing over and over again, especially if you're trying to dial something in. If you can't grind it the same way, tamp it the same way every time, you're introducing too many variables. So it's hard to say, well, I just need to change my grind setting because maybe you just didn't tamp as hard. Yeah. And let's talk about tamping. People are hearing us say that. It's, it's a device that fits perfectly into that basket that helps kind of compress and push down the, the coffee. And what we're trying to do with that is take any pockets of, of coffee or air out of it so it's as dense as possible evenly. Right. Yep. And to that point, it's it's to get that water in, have it fill up the entire puck before it pushes through. And ideally, you want that to come out almost in the middle of the puck. Yeah. And, and tamping and the pressure that's applied is just one variable to changing the time that the espresso runs. And it's... There is no correct answer other than being consistent. Um, every every person that, that uses an espresso machine inherently tamps differently. As long as you do it the same or nearly the same every time, if let's say you tamp harder than I do, that means that maybe you don't grind as fine as I do. So everybody, you know, it's just always different. What's important is that it's the same. I think people have in their head the thought of, you know, you get this tamper and you just bear down on it and push as hard as you can and you don't, you don't need to you don't do really that. want to do that, yeah. actually. Um, it's just important that it's consistent time and time again. So that needs to be part of your thought process and your formula. When you when you feel like you have a good grind, just because it's not coming through properly, you you might consider, am I tampering it too hard? Yeah. Or maybe a little bit more pressure. That's part of the process. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the part to get the coffee, the shot, to where you want. Once mm-hmm. you get that dialed in, I think – for in America, and this might be true around the world, I think the milk drinks from espresso, uh, espresso are, are more popular than drinking just the, the black coffee drinks that come from them, espresso or doubles or things like that. So now we jump into to doing the milk right. Yeah. And that's a uh, whole, whole separate challenge. Yeah. And, and, you know, people go, well, you just warm it up. And it's, it's, a, it's not just warming up the milk. No, no. Uh, and, and the amount of air that you introduce to it will change with what drink you're trying to make. There are some drinks where you just want it basically steamed with very little air introduced yeah, all the way up to cappuccino where you're trying to make a pretty thick foam. And that's just about how much air you introduce to it. So generally what you're, there's a wand that's, that's shooting steam that has air integrated into it and you're using that to heat the milk and it's incorporating air. And typically what you do, the first stage is what I've always heard and I, I call stretching the milk. So you go from, you know, a certain level in the pitcher, you can see it stretching up the, the sides of the pitcher as you go. That's introducing air. And then what you do is put the wand tip further down in and create a whirlpool, and it's breaking all those bubbles. Those big bubbles, they're smashing into each other, making smaller and smaller and smaller bubbles. So ultimately, hopefully, you have no large bubbles left. Tiny bubbles. Very tiny bubbles, and that gives you a much better consistency Um a little bit more velvety, but again, it depends on the drink you're trying to make, how much air you introduce and how big the bubbles end up being. Um, you know, for a flat white, you're looking for not a lot of air and very, very small bubbles uh, all the way up to, like I said, cappuccino. cappuccino. You're looking yeah. for larger bubbles and a lot more foam. There will actually be a layer of foam on top that you can push back with a spoon. Yeah, I saw a barista say, you know, uh, a latte, if you set a spoon on it, it would eventually in, in a matter of seconds fall through and be in uh, cappuccino. It would just sit on top as long as Should. you left it there. Yep. Yeah. If it's made properly. That's right. Um, but there's a technique to, to doing that too. You know, you talked about, you know, putting the wand in and, and kind of getting the milk and then the air, but how you angle it, the time at which, cause you know, you're trying to get it to a certain temperature. Cause if you get over a certain temperature, you're kind of going to ruin that milk. It's not yeah, going to taste. It'll start good. breaking down. It's not going to yeah. taste good. I forget what temperature exactly it is. It's about 160, 150, 160 degrees, somewhere yep. in there. You don't want to go over that. Um, and there's a general rule to kind of guide you to get to that point. Yeah, so generally, if the pitcher becomes too hot to touch, you're done. Yeah. Um, and so it would be interesting, actually, to see if I steam some milk, what temperature I actually pull it out at. That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I can maybe go. I probably err on the side of it not being hot enough because I don't want to burn it. Yeah. Um, and really, if you're at 135 degrees versus 140 degrees, it's not significantly changing the taste of the milk. 
or maybe even the texture, you just have longer to integrate the bubbles that extra time. So uh, there's not an exact temperature that you have to get to. There's just kind of a, a wall that you want, you don't want to go. Past. And the reason I bring up the, the touching as being kind of that, you know, helping you decide when it's to temp is because each, each wand or each uh, machine might be a little different. You know, as far as yeah. how fast it heats up, what kind of pressure it's putting out to get that. Some might be really quick that you get there. Some might not be. How important is it to, is there a certain amount of time to work the milk? So if you have a very strong uh, machine, it, can it be too quick? Do you need to turn that down a little bit and let the milk kind of work a little bit more to get that sweetness to come out of it? Or is it just when it's there, it's there? Uh, I th- uh, yes. To answer your question, yeah. I think sometimes you may have to, you just have to get the feel of every machine. Okay. So. We've got your machine, the Rancholio here. We've got my machine, the the Breville Barista Express. Uh, the steam wand on the Breville is is significantly underpowered compared to the Rancholio, which means it's a little bit harder to get air integrated into it because there's not as much pressure. But once you get it integrated, it's easier to work the texture because it takes longer for it. It takes probably twice the amount of time to get yeah. milk to the right temperature as the Rancholio does. But it also depends on, for example, the first drinks that we made – I probably steamed close to 14, 15 ounces of milk. It took a decent amount of time for these cortados. I only did about six ounces, and it was done in 10 seconds. Yeah. I mean, like that, it was done. And so, still that creamy kind of texture we still have. Yeah. So it, you just have to – that's probably the hardest thing to me to learn to do was to, to get milk to the right texture, and I still am not all that good at it. It's, it's very difficult to get it to the right texture that you want. I, I don't know what the bar is to know if it's good or not, but uh, yours is definitely way better than mine. So I don't. I would say yours is really, really good. Well, on both of the drinks that I've made on your machine so far, both rounds of drinks, there's been too much air, and I think it's because there's just a lot more pressure in that. So it's figuring that, that out. Wand. Yeah, it's just yeah. learning that. Um, I actually like even less air than this one. This, okay. These cortados that we made. Okay. So what else is important? Uh, how, how important is it for glassware? I mean, because when we talk about different kinds of drinks, they're in different size glasses. You yep. know, this Cortado's in a smaller glass. Uh, a latte is going to be probably in the biggest glass. Yes. Um, oh, can you, or cappuccino. Yeah. A cappuccino. Yeah. Are they similar be, 10, 12 ounce? Yeah, or even 16 something. Really? Yeah. If you want to do a, a well... Two doubles, which what a lot of people will do for a cappuccino. So you're talking about four ounces or so of coffee. You're probably going to want a 16 or so ounce. So a lot of times you go to a coffee shop and those big, big mugs, yeah. it's a 16 ounce mug. Um, you know, I don't think glassware is, is all that important. So if you had a, is there a universal size? Would you say there's a size that if you got a espresso machine, because people are, you know, they go to a, Cafe, they, they go, okay, I'm getting all kinds of different cups, like we're using different cups. Uh, is there one that you would say, this is, you know, if you get one this size, 12 ounce, that's kind of your universal. 12 ounce is a really good universal size for lattes. Uh, six to eight ounces is ideal for a flat white because they should okay. be a lot smaller. And then about four ounces for a Cortado. If you've got those three glasses, or really if you just have, you know, a 12 ounce and just don't fill it up, that's fine, too. So that works. You can really use anything. Where it becomes important is if you want to do latte art. Okay. A straight-walled glass is a lot harder to use than one that flares. Okay. Because when you're when you're doing the latte art, the first thing you do is you're filling the glass up with milk to, to take that space away before you ever start actually pouring the art on top. Right. If you have a flared glass, once you get to the, the time that you're you're pouring, because it's flared, it takes longer to fill that extra width up. So okay. you have you have more time to actually pour a latte art. If it's straight walled, you have a lot less time because okay. it's rising up the top faster. I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but what I found is a you know your your typical coffee mug with straight sides. It's very difficult to pour for me to pour latte art in them. That's why you never see it. I don't think. I, I mean, maybe Probably you do sometimes, not. but I don't also know just that not I've quite as classy looking as the flared glasses. Well, that's kind of what I like. Even these little ones with the yeah, flare on, I, like I think. Are, yeah. You know, it's it's a very personal preference thing, and you see all different things. Um, honestly, what I use most of the time are the teacups from our 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 dinner okay. plateware. It's a six ah. ounce cup. It works perfectly. That's just what I use for those. And then we have some. Uh, larger, probably 12-ounce mugs that we got from Ikea for like $4, and they work great. 
Let's, but uh, I also know people like Bradley, if you're out there listening, he's got some like forty dollar espresso glasses. Like, does he really? He's got some really cool ones, and they're 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 a conversation piece, they're a statement piece. They're really really cool. Yeah, the, the coffee doesn't taste better out of them. They're yeah. just they're nice glasses. They're nice glasses, right? It's the same, you know, with wine glasses. Rydell versus yeah. you know a wine glass. You know, wine will taste fine out of a cheaper glass. The experience is not as nice. Yeah, but you know it'll it'll still hold wine. Absolutely. Same with coffee. So, you know. There are people that will that will want to invest in really nice glasses, and I think that's great because it's part of the. I mean, coffee is an experience, so sure. whatever makes the experience fun, um, I just kind of use whatever I've got on hand. I, I'm I'm not too picky. Now you hear sometimes, not sometimes, you hear that Italians have kind of rules on when you can drink, when you should drink espresso, and then the the milk drinks and things like that. Um, here in the states, we don't. Uh, we don't apply those rules to what we do. No, you can drink whatever you want, whenever you want. Because I, I mean, I'm I'm going to now that I've got this machine. I'm sure after a lot of uh, dinners that we have over here, I'm going to want some kind of drink after dinner. I, I do like a coffee after dinner a lot of times. So it, they're almost like a dessert too. Yeah, I mean, well, you mentioned that drink. chocolate. Oh yeah, you definitely need to try those. Those are really good. Okay, but I will do that at home too. I'll make a, a latte or a, a flat white after dinner sometimes. Um, Sometimes espresso, whatever. There's not really hard and fast rules about okay. when you're supposed to drink things, but the Italians definitely have their own take on <laughs> on milk drinks and espressos. Well, and I had my take because I like a coffee, and I always, you know, remembered growing up that if you had trouble sleeping at night, you know, a warm glass of milk would help you. So I thought, well, it just makes sense if I'm going to have a little coffee and I put a little warm milk in it. That can't be a bad thing. So that was my logic behind thinking it was okay to have a cappuccino or a latte in the evening. Have whatever you want, whenever you want. All right, let's finish up the episode by talking about, they heard you mention it, latte art. And a lot of people (laughs) go to these cafes and they go, yeah, that's never going to happen. People do pretty good latte art at home. These home, I'll call them home baristas. Yeah. They get pretty good at them. You're pretty good at them. No, I'm not. It's, Uh. it's, It's extremely difficult. It took me forever to figure out how to even get anything to sit on top. Like for anything white to show up on top. Yeah. Uh, it just it took forever to even get to that point, and then actually making it look like something is a whole separate challenge. But it's it's just about the correct texture of milk. Um, it needs to be in this window of having enough air that it'll sit on top, but not so much that it just foams and yeah. spreads out, and you've got you know. And then it's lines. technique because it's it's how quick you pour because you pour in a certain amount to get it to a certain level. To yep. fill it up without making it look creamy. So in a pitcher, milk will inherently split to milk at the bottom and foam at the top. And so if you pour too slowly, what will happen is the foam will just rise up the pitcher and you're just getting milk come out. And that's not going to sit on top. So you have to pour faster than you would think that you would to get that foam to integrate with the milk. And that's what's actually sitting on top. Yeah. So that and you, the spout has to be almost touching the coffee. That's what I was always doing wrong. I would hold the pitcher too high and it's got too much momentum, it just wants to go up underneath. Yeah. And so, I don't know if you were watching, the first thing you do is you hold the pitcher up high, and that's to making fill the all cup. the milk. Yeah, to go underneath and just raise the level, and then you put the spout down right near the, the surface, and that's what will actually make it sit on top. Now, I, and I will say that, and I, I haven't been able to do this yet, but I understand that, for me, I need to learn the patience of trying to do the art, meaning when you pour that, at that point when you're getting the spout closer – you don't have to be so fast. It can be a little bit more slow and mm-hmm. deliberate. Give it a second as you're building whatever you're building, whether it be a flower or a heart or whatever you're doing. The good news is even if you completely screw it up and it doesn't work, it still tastes good. Yeah. And yeah. I, so I try every time I make something, I try to pour latte art. I'd say half the time it looks like something. The other half, it's just either nothing sits on top or it's just a blob. It still tastes good. It still tastes so great. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I'm impressed that, you know, I thought the latte art was only for the bigger cups. But on these little cortados, you you still did the latte it's, art, and I was impressed. It's it's definitely harder on these. Yeah, um, I was I was actually surprised that it it worked. I wasn't expect <laughs> I was expecting disaster, but it, yeah. something and, showed up. And I bring that up because I think it's it's a fun part of making the espressos. It is. Uh, That's the why drinks. I always try it. It's just something fun to. And you know, especially if you have to. company over and you have a dinner or something, and you're able to get to a point where you can do a little something in the glass. I just think it's fun. But that being it's said, cool. there's no shame in it not working because it is it is difficult to do. But like I said, even if it doesn't work, it still tastes fine. Hey, when, so. when, right now I'm at the stage as 
when I'm doing my latte art, it's just like a blob, and I ask people to tell me what they see. Yeah. <laughs> and then like that's what clouds. I was going for. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, it might be a dolphin, might be whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So the so, one, I mean, what I've been trying to do on all these, kind of the first thing that you learn to do, it's called a rosette. It's the one that, you know, it's got the different, like, concentric circles going up. Yeah. Three uh, or four. And yeah. then the That four. and the heart are the two kind of things that people. Entry kind of. Yeah, entry level things, but. Yeah. We were looking at some pictures earlier of people making <laughs> like a Pegasus and a Swan and all kind of crazy stuff. Which look they're perfect. just on a different level. Yeah, I don't know how they. That's a different level. Yeah, but you know what? Impressive. Doesn't taste any better because of that Swan. That's exactly right. It might taste better. It looks cool. Yeah, but it doesn't make it taste better. That's exactly right. Well, man, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming out and and uh, getting into some more coffee things. You know, the espresso this time. Uh, hopefully, we dive a little deeper. We'll come back and, and do some more shows on uh, espresso and coffee sure. and drinks and things like that. Appreciate it, Tyler. Thanks, man. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey in Your Own Backyard. And until our next episode, enjoy your next pour.